Paul, I've been intrigued by philosophy of biology, and I'll tell you why. When I did my doctorate in the biological sciences and neurosciences, I loved that. This was in the early and mid-60s, uh, and I was, I've always been interested in philosophy in, 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 in broadly. But I never combined the two. I never thought of neuroscience and philosophy. I thought they were just two separate interests. Obviously, for the last four or five decades, philosophy of biology has become a real field and has grown. You've been one of the pioneers. So give me a sense of the growth of the field, why philosophy of biology, and how you look at it. Yeah. Well, like a lot of people of my generation, kind of the second I suppose, generation of people in philosophy of biology. I got into it from philosophy of mind. And uh, I was working on a PhD thesis about facing the problem of different sciences characterizing the emotions in completely different ways. Um, you know, a bit like the old parable about the guy holding the trunk of the elephant and the guy holding the tail <laughs> of the elephant. And I got drawn more and more towards the uh, biologically based theories and towards psychoevolutionary accounts of emotion. And I'd argue that's pretty typical of why philosophy of biology has really taken off. Uh, so I tell my students often that, that throughout history, philosophy has always gone where the epistemic action is. Okay? <laughs> if I was a 14th century philosopher, I'd be doing theology like Thomas Aquinas, because <laughs> yeah. that's where the interesting knowledge claims are coming from. <laughs> and if you think about early 20th century philosophy, the really exciting stuff is coming out of physics. So if, it's, if you were a philosopher like Bertrand Russell, 1905, mm -hmm. you would do exactly what Russell did. You would start writing the ABC of relativity <laughs> because this stuff is, wow, you know, do these people really know these things? How are they knowing that? It's really intriguing. Uh, and I'd say that in the second half of the 20th century, biology just came to mm -hmm. take center sure. stage. In, and you have really interesting things like molecular biology is such a powerful and successful science but it doesn't have key features that we think of as typical of powerful and successful sciences. It doesn't have a, uh, a small core of theory that can be expressed in highly general mathematical terms. It doesn't have, in fact, what a lot of early philosophers of science would have said was necessary to have a theory at all. Mm. So in 1959, uh, Jack Smart, who was uh, one of my PhD advisors, uh, wrote a paper called Can Biology Be an Exact Science? I still love that paper because uh, he, um, he says, no, biology can never be an exact mm -hmm. science. It's just kind of engineering because mm -hmm. it doesn't have the distinctive features that we see in the really powerful sciences like physics and chemistry. Um, and so that's a paradox. Uh, we've got this incredibly powerful and successful science and it doesn't fit our basic models in philosophy of science. So I think those are key reasons why the discipline took off. So, so, yeah. so ha what can then philosophy do to biology? How does it impact biology? I is there a way that that happens as opposed to just observing biology? Yeah. So I think philosophers of biology do, philosophers uh, do a lot of things, right? I mean, you know, I, I, uh, as a philosopher, you've always really got to have a story about why you're doing what you do. It's no good to just say, this is what we do in the philosophy department, right? <laughs> you're a philosopher, for goodness sake, right? <laughs> um, so we actually do a lot of different things. And in some sense, you know, we're kind of epistemic magpies. We go around looking for interesting stuff about knowledge and worrying about it. Uh, and so in this case, sometimes philosophers are drawn to biology because there's, there seem to be things that we care about a lot in philosophy where biologists given what we believe about science and about the world, biologists ought to have the answers. So, for example, uh, if you're somebody who uh, is trying to understand the basis of ethics, you're going to be drawn to mm -hmm. understand human evolution, where did morality come from, how does that challenge or support that. Mm -hmm. So sometimes philosophers go to biology because they sort of feel the biologists on my worldview ought to be the people with authority here, and so I'm going to go there. Sometimes people in philosophy of science, and I think this is, it's great work, but it's the least distinctive thing. Philosophers of science look for case studies. So they might say, I'm really interested in the role of models in science. So let's go and find some sciences where people build a lot of models, mm -hmm, apparently mm -hmm. successfully study what's going there, on there. Um, and you know, you might uh, go to um, theoretical population genetics, or you might go to uh, climate science, wherever it is. I think the most distinctive kind of real, you know, somebody who is a full-time philosopher of biology and likely to stay 
doing <laughs> philosophy of biology for the rest of their career is work where there's no real distinction between being what's called a theoretical biologist and a philosopher of biology, oh. where you're, you're basically looking at the, the big, difficult, conceptual <clears throat> issues in the foundations of biological science and trying to sort of make progress on building better frameworks and better tools for doing biology. Mm. So that's maybe the kind of core. But if you, you go to a philosophy of biology conference, you'll find uh, people who are not full-time philosophers of biology, but who need some biology. You'll find people who are full-time philosophers of science who just now happen to be focusing on some biology. And as you'll find as people- As case studies. As case studies, to, to, yeah. To see um, how philosophy of science works in a particular area. Or to improve philosophy of science yeah. by dealing with anomalies, right? Mm. We've said, you know, science should be like this, and hey, here's some great science, and it isn't mm. like that, so mm. we better work out what's going on right. here. Yeah, so um, I hear really three different yeah. kinds of, uh, of uh, uh, objectives in philosophy mm. of biology. The first that you mentioned is where biology can impact uh, perennial philosophical mm -hmm. questions. You mentioned ethics, mm. uh, there may be others as well. Uh, second is where philosophy of, of science can use biology as case studies. And the third is where philosophy can help biology develop, whether it's theoretical biology or some sort of other process that, to help the, the development of biology. So those yeah. are three different areas and they obviously intersect in, in different mm -hmm. ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, so for example, um, I've always been very centrally interested in developmental biology and that's mainly because I do think that uh, how living systems succeed in becoming and maintaining themselves as highly organized systems is a really deeply conceptually challenging problem. Um, but of course, that's also got a lot of implications. People, who, for example, who are interested in uh, the limits or uh, sort of barriers to evolutionary explanations of complex human behavior are also often very interested in the philosophy of behavioral development. Um, but centrally, I mean, uh, a lot of my work has been about what I think of as our kind of pseudo explanations in uh, developmental biology. So I've been critical of the notion of innateness, not because I want to get biology out of the uh, behavioral sciences, absolutely not, but because of a very old criticism that goes back to the 1920s. Uh, there's a title of a paper by a uh, wonderful Chinese psychologist at Berkeley, How Are Our Instincts Acquired? <laughs> that saying that something is instinctive or innate is an end of inquiry when we should be beginning inquiry. And so that's what I mean by a pseudo explanation. Um, and so diagnosing that methodologically and saying the problem here is that this is not actually an explanation when it purports to be an explanation. That's philosophical work, classic philosophy of science work, but hopefully also usefully contributing to, to theoretical debates within the biosciences.